I'm a ranger at the Grand Canyon National Park, Arizona. It's an incredible job, and you get to meet so many new people, apart from the obvious scenic advantage. The management there provides amazing service. Our rooms and stations are nice, and they renovate every year before the massive tourist rush. The meals are delicious and fulfilling. Anyway, yeah, I love the job. You might know that the Grand Canyon National Park also shares a boundary with the Navajo region. One of the questions I'm often asked by visitors, especially since I patrol that side of the park, is, do you ever have any strange experiences on that side? Or, if the Navajo people are spooky? Now, according to our training sessions and briefings, the Navajo like to stay to themselves. That's a big reason why I have not really seen them near the park before. Now that I think about it, it was just the other day when I saw an older Navajo man, about 70. He had a hunched back and the typical Native American getup. I approached him, asked if he needed help navigating. He looked lost. As soon as I did, his eyes opened wide and grabbed my hands into it with a really strong grip. It even hurt a little. I don't think the old man had that much strength left in him. He pulled me, so I was staring into his eyes at eye level, and he spoke in a very hushed voice. He informed me that he had been looking for me since that morning, but had only just found me. When I asked if I knew him, he said that was irrelevant. His next words shook me. He was seeking me out to warn me about my death. I was speechless. I kept asking, who are you? I didn't know what to think about it at that point. I asked him what he meant and told me one of the tribesmen was trying to learn magic, and they fell prey to the evils that they could achieve with it. He was apparently said to become a skinwalker. Now, I don't know much about the Navajo people's beliefs, or their faith in local stories, or any other religions or factions' beliefs, but I didn't believe any of it. They were fairy tales to me. Fictional stories. They sounded so absurd. That's what I thought at the time. The old man was telling me tales, and I figured he was delusional, especially since he was so old. I shrugged off his words, and began to walk him towards the gate that would lead him back to the Navajo region. The entire way, he kept shaking and repeating as if in a stance that I needed to stay inside my cabin tonight and I should not come out no matter what happened. I led him to the gate. There were some other Native Americans already waiting for the old man outside, to my surprise. As soon as they saw the old man with me, they ran up to us and took the old man away, at a speed that really made me think. Anyway, I watched them walk off and disappear off into the distance. I came back inside and got back to my daily duties and checking. The rest of the day was rather uneventful, with the exception of a couple of losing their kid in a park. We immediately helped them, and thankfully, we found the child. After sunset, I went inside my unit and took a break. I ate some food and relaxed a little. While I was laying on my bed, reading a book, I heard this shriek in the distance. It was faint, but I heard it loud and clear. I turned to look at my radio anticipating a voice on the other end, saying something about the shriek. There was nothing. I waited for a few more moments. The radio was still quiet. I just shrugged and went back to my reading. I heard the same sound again, this time a lot louder and closer. I was up and gearing up already. I thought maybe nobody else heard it, even though it would be strange. I left my firearm inside, I didn't think I needed it, and I rushed outside in the direction of where I thought I had heard the sound come from. It was a dark night, and it was quiet, which is why the rustling in the distance was so clear. I heard the shriek again, and this time, it sounded like an injured animal. It came from behind a tree. I began to approach it slowly, and I stopped dead in my tracks when something emerged from behind the tree. It was something I can't really explain. It was bent down on all fours and growling while looking down. There was drool coming out of its mouth. I took my flashlight from my pocket and flashed over it. That was a big mistake. 
the thing immediately hissed and stared directly into my eyes. They were pure black, and it scared me. I turned around, ran back. I had nothing to defend myself with. I could hear the thing running behind me. I ran in the direction of the ranger station, went inside, closing the door. I went into the security room and checked the cameras. The one focused on the door outside the station showed that this thing was chewing on something I couldn't tell. Then it started, walking away again on all fours. I stayed in the station until the thing was out of sight. I double-checked all the cameras. I went outside and straight to my room. The next day, I told the other rangers about it in the morning. They checked last night's recordings and were as freaked out about it as I was. We were now extra careful that night and the night after, but we never saw that thing again and I could not get the old man who had warned me earlier out of my head. This story was told to me by an uncle. He is a park ranger in Ontario. He frequently commented on his work, being relatively calm after COVID, mostly because there'd been much fewer tourists, but he'd still have to go out in the wilderness and check on his stuff. One day, he had to go through the woods with a colleague there were reports of people hanging around without permission. Nothing unusual. Just some visitors are just mean teenagers sometimes. The issue with these reports was that there were numerous sightings of people carrying all sorts of luggage, like axes and animal skulls. Just weird stuff. People can be pretty racist in these parts. It's possible these were the Algonquin people. After all, this is their land. Like, imagine unhinged people, worshipping Odin in the cold wilderness of modern-day Canada, aside from whatever occult stuff they were pulling up. According to my uncle, you can find many loons, madmen, and weird people in the woods. There was a word of bonfires, and it was what truly worried the rangers. Nobody was in the mood to deal with a fire in the middle of a health apocalypse, especially considering the past events in California and the Amazonian jungle. Like Canada, surely is cold, but nobody wanted to see mass fires provoked by mad people. And so, they hiked across the wilderness, saw all the normal things. They checked on the state of the trails. If the seasonal animals were doing fine, the state of vegetation and that sort of stuff. The further they advanced, the more they began to find strange things. Odd symbols carved onto the tree's crust. Some seemed like runes, Residues such as trash, those weird Odin worshippers didn't mind eating modern-day snacks, it seemed. Marks on the ground and small signals here. They're about people camping in places were not to the general public. Like, people had been actively going around the wilderness. But my uncle and his colleague, John, let's call him that, never encountered campers. Whoever was going around had already left. My uncle and his partner would always find weird stuff, like, one time, a cape and a helmet, and even a real sword. Someone had been putting on some Nordic cult stuff, or something like that. There would also be incense and some other religious miscellaneous items. And so one night, my uncle and John decided to settle their camp next to a huge elm tree, with the hopes of the tree covering their tent from the winds at night, when temperatures would reach very, very low. They ate heated beans and rice, while talking about stuff and exchanging stories. Every night, they'd use a portable radio to talk with people in the base area, exchanging news. At some point, my uncle's colleague goes to the trees to empty his bladder, and my uncle waits by the fire. Nothing out of the blue. The times pass and my uncle does not hear John returning. His partner was this huge man in his 40s, a chatty person whom he'd frequently hear, even before he reached the camp. So, my uncle begins looking at the sides to catch a glimpse of what was going around, but saw nothing. John was carrying a lantern, so at least one could have expected to see the lights by the trees. But all my uncle saw was black. The minutes began to pass, and he called for John, asking if things were fine. No. That's when he realized the woods were strangely quiet. There was no wind, nor the natural sounds you'd expect to hear at night. Nothing. 
and that got him on alert. John would sometimes play a harmless prank or two, especially considering their line of work wasn't the most active of them all, and they spent days outside. But this time, things were too calm and quiet to be natural. Things were off. My uncle knew it. So he began to ask towards the nothingness if everything was okay. Was John fine? Where was he? Nobody answered. Well, the wind did. It started to blow stronger and stronger. It straight up seemed like somebody was trying to settle in the atmosphere of a horror movie. My uncle then heard a subtle whisper at his right side. He tried to pay attention to the sound, pulling his body to that side. It was a man's voice, a weak one. My uncle got up, grabbed his light and the rifle, went into the woods. The fire was weak enough to make sure no accidents would happen while he was away. So, he walked towards the bigger trees. He kept on asking if John was fine. The voice was slowly getting stronger the more he entered into the wilderness until he could hear John's voice calling his name for help. That's when my uncle stops. Something was off. Even if that voice seemed like John's, he's already had to help him once. And the times John seriously asked for help, his tone was different. Like, the voice was the same, so the modulations. But the tone did not match. And the tone of our voices is pretty much dictated by our moods. This was not John. A ball of anxiety grew in my uncle's body. And he is one of the more stoic and calm men I've ever met. The certainty was there. Something that wasn't John was calling for him. But my uncle had his rifle and light prepared. He never went to the church or seemed to believe in that sort of thing. But he also told me that sometimes you have to respect the rules of the wild. He began to move the lights in front of him to the side and side, alert and waiting. If John was fooling around, he already would have seen it. But what my uncle saw was something else entirely. It was very tall, like four or five meters. In front of my uncle was a very small clearing surrounded by older and taller trees. The figure was a shady thing, around eight or nine meters away from him. It had no gender and was too tall to be a person. The creature was thin and had antlers. In fact, it seemed like its head was a moose's skull. It was blurry. At first, he thought those weird cultists were using an animal's head, but it was far too large and tall to be a person. It would have to have been very uncomfortable to walk around in that in the middle of the night, and the short hairs of my uncle's nape stood up. This being moved towards him. My uncle yelled out as a warning. It stayed quiet, and he readied his rifle. It called him with John's voice, but much more distorted and crackly. My uncle firing into the air, then uh, turning on his heels and running. The sound that thing made was not human. My uncle ran and ran, even though it was into the dark wilderness, which, unfortunately, he got lost and had to wait for daylight to find the trail. He only had his light, and even that was dying. In the morning... John was there waiting for him, worried. He had heard my uncle calling for him at night, and another bunch of weird, strange noises that he could not quite understand. When he had returned to the campsite, nobody was there. My uncle was not answering his calls, and so this is what they both believed to have been a wendigo. I'm not too sure about that, either is he, but it's definitely speculated that what they saw and encountered was of the supernatural. I have worked many different jobs in my lifetime. Starting as a janitor, I worked on a farm for about two years at one point. Later, as a PE teacher in a high school. I was even an officer before eventually moving to New Jersey and, eventually, getting a job as a park ranger in the Pine Barrens. I had moved to New Jersey to be closer to my family. The job didn't seem to be hard. I would work four days a week and I would spend all my time in the park the other three would be my days off. Now, I haven't worked for the park for a very long time, and I'm about to tell you why. I think I lasted a year, and maybe even less than that. 
I had a series of very strange things happen to me there. And the final straw made me quit my job as soon as I got the chance. So, I began working at Pine Barrens in April of that year. I was introduced to the job and the park by the park services. The place is humongous. It stretches over the area that is 22% of New Jersey. My job was to patrol a certain area, make sure everything was in order. If you've ever visited the Pine Barrens, you would know that abandoned buildings and towns are scattered throughout the park. I would clock in on a Tuesday, work through to Friday, and Saturday through Monday. The first couple of weeks went smooth. I was getting familiar with the woods and my route. The third week was when my first spooky experience happened. It was Thursday evening. I was going my regular route. The park was buzzing with nature sounds. There were no people anywhere that I'd run into that day. I know that sometimes kids like to wander the park at night, looking for ghosts or just a secluded place to hang, but I had not seen any of them either. I was taking little mental notes of my surroundings, and I noticed the humming and buzzing. I couldn't tell where it was coming from at first. I looked around for a few minutes and still nothing. The noise was beginning to get closer, which is when I realized it was nearing me from above. I looked up and saw three bright lights moving in a circle, almost as if they were spiraling down towards me. Instinctively, I ducked and ran as fast as I could. I probably ran for a couple of hundred feet before turning around to see the lights were still there. They were not. There was no humming now either. I dropped to the ground, trying to gather my composite and catch my breath. I also tried to make sense of what had happened five minutes prior. I do believe in aliens, even though I had never had an encounter before. I had no clue what else that could have been, so I kind of made an agreement with myself. Those were aliens, and I wouldn't think about that anymore. And it was okay for a while. I have never seen those lights after that. My second experience happened about five months after I began working in the park. I was again going on my regular route. It was now about 7 p.m., and at this point, since it was October, the sun was getting very low in the sky, and it was getting dark. The route was clear. Everything seemed to be in order, until I noticed something lurking behind the trees, about a hundred yards away from me. At first, it looked like a person, maybe a man about 5'7". I thought it might have been some college kid playing a prank, trying to scare me. I saw his shoulder peeking behind a tree. I yelled out that nobody is allowed to be in the woods this late in this time of year. He didn't move. Only after I shouted the third time, he had finally moved in front of the tree. I could take a good look at him. When I saw him, I nearly had a heart attack. He was dressed in dirty, torn-up clothing. But the most disturbing thing about him was his head, or lack of one, I should say. I looked at him, not knowing if I should ask what he was, what happened to him or just bolt out of there as fast as I could. I did neither for a solid three minutes. I froze. Even though I noticed he had begun moving closer to me, I still could not lift a finger. He started running up to me as he was getting closer. I realized he was also translucent. This was a poltergeist. Now, when it comes to an alien, I'm a believer. When it comes to ghosts, however, I was very skeptical and sarcastic at times that anybody would talk about ghosts or demons or any alleged paranormal activity. I moved to the right, a couple of steps as he was running straight at me, and he just vanished. I turned around to see where he had gone, but there was no trace of him, only a vapory trail of mist, just what looked like a cloud of dust almost settling. After that second incident, I decided that all my love for nature in the outdoors, and as much as I loved being a ranger, staying here was not worth it. This hot mess of a place was not worth me going literally insane for trying to keep working there. I called them the next day and explained the situation. They told me that something like this had already happened for their previous rangers. They tried to convince me to stay on the job for longer and doubled my pay. But I refused. I would not risk losing my own mind. 
I have a friend who worked as a forest ranger in the U.S. for a few years. He's told me some freaky stories about what he's found at work. I'm convinced that neither all forest rangers are in this huge inside joke to tell the most crazy stories about their work to anybody who asks about it. Or, the woods hide much more than one would think. One of his stories that's always living rent-free in my head is when he told me about this weird pit that he found in the middle of the woods. He said that they had received reports of this dug-up pit. Apparently, some colleagues had found it while patrolling. Just a huge, large pit in the middle of the woods. He went to check it out, and sure enough, the pit was there. Just a hole in the floor about the size of a car. But right in the middle of the pit, there was a vintage record player. Just there. He picked it up, and it seemed to be in mint condition. He took it to his office. The other rangers there just filled it up. Nobody ever came to ask about the record player, so he kept it. Next week, they got a complaint from their superiors as to why nobody had filled the pit yet. Confused, my friend assured that he and his colleagues had already filled it up. They assured them that the pit was still there. They were sent to inspect, and sure enough, it was again as if nobody had even touched it. No trace of the dirt that they had even put on top of it. There was only one difference. This time, on the middle of it, one of those very vintage cigarette cases. My friend picked it up and once again filled the pit, figuring somebody must be up to some funny business here, maybe some rituals or something, but none of it made sense. Again, nobody asked about the cigarette case. Not that he'd expect to, so he kept it. A few days go by and they get a report. The pit is back again. Now, they're having none of it. They go and carry a small security camera, strapping it to a nearby tree, finally catching the pit digging maniac. When they get there, they find a small, old-looking leather-bound notebook. Once again, my friend grabs it, takes it with him. They install the camera, fill up the pit, and leave. The pit never came back. Once the camera was placed, whoever was digging it chickened out and left it alone. However, my friend's curiosity did not die there. He took the things to an expert and confirmed they were all genuine and in extremely good conditions. A weird place for a vintage collector to store his treasures. But the strangest thing of all was that he found the journal. He opened it up and found a newspaper cutout. It read... April 17th, 1972. And on the journal, there was only one phrase written. It worked. Another story he told me is about this kid that had come stumbling out of the woods one day. He was somewhat dirty, but it just looked like a normal amount of dirty as a kid would be after playing around all day. He was wearing a t-shirt and jeans, so nothing out of the ordinary. When the rangers found him, they took him to one of their offices to ask about his parents how he had ended up there. The kid answered he was just playing in the woods and got distracted by chasing a beetle. He had lost his parents and his brother and ended up where they found him. He seemed completely normal, but when he spoke, he had a strange accent as if English wasn't his mother tongue, but had learned it very well. They asked for the name of his parents and he replied they were called K-98 and D-54. They insisted on their real names, but the kid kept repeating those numbers and did not know what the rangers meant. They asked if he knew their phone numbers, but the kid didn't seem to know what a phone was. He just seemed to slowly get more and more nervous. They kept asking him things to try and help him, about how long ago he had got lost, if he knew exactly where he was before, if he could remember where he had his parents and where they parked their car, where he was from, but the kid answered nothing. All those words, he seemed to have never heard them before. He seemed to be completely lost about it. Suddenly, the kid gets up, said that he had made a big mistake, and promptly exited the office, running. The rangers ran after him, but he was fast. He went into the woods and vanished, leaving no trace behind. The rangers went straight inside, but the kid was gone. After searching all afternoon, 
They figured they were going to need help. They called in search and rescue, conducted extensive searching, covering much of the terrain as they could. They never found anything. Not even footsteps. Everybody was ready for the parents to show up and asking about their kid at any moment. They never did. Missing posters were placed with his description, also shared on social media. The police even got involved at some point, but the child was never heard from again. Slowly, the search died out. He became a missing person report. No photo. Address or name to go by. Just an extremely generic physical description. And the name of his parents. K-98 and D-54. My friend said it became some sort of taboo topic. Nobody wants to think where a lost kid in the forest ended up. The thing is, even if my friend is sure nobody will ever find out what happened, he is convinced that kid was not lost in the woods, but somehow placed there. Perhaps his parents were alien. It's interesting, the whole case surrounding it. After the search died off, everything on social media was pulled. Any documentation released was now redacted. Something about it is very, very fishy. Ever since I've known for myself, I have loved nature. I could even say that it's my passion, which is why the job of even a park ranger was perfect, until one day. I worked at this nature park where the visitation hours were from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. There were many of us, and our shifts changed every week. So, one week, I would do first, and the next week, I would do second, and so on. One Friday, I was second shift, which meant I would stay until everybody left and check if everything is okay. Then, I was off. I did a short tour that a few visitors asked for that day, but other than that, it was pretty unengaged, since I didn't have to do a lot. I was already walking and checking up everything, long before I was supposed to be done with work. It already got dark, and I was walking through the woods. I noticed a flash of lightning at me, from behind me, on one of the trees in the distance. It was weird. I went to check it out, but... As I got to the point that I thought the light was coming from, suddenly, it came at me again from the place that I had come from. It was super weird. I yelled out whoever was doing that to knock it off. As I said, the flash of light came from a completely different direction. There's no way that a person could travel that way in such a short time. So, I realized I was probably being messed with by two different people, figuring it was my coworkers even though we weren't really close, nor do we ever do this kind of stuff. I yelled again. I was not going to participate in this stupid joke. Whoever or whatever it was should leave. I left. I did not have any control over this and could not do anything about it if they were purposefully trying to mess with me. So basically, it wasn't my problem. I informed my supervisor that somebody could still be in the park. He said that he would take over. I left got in my car and began to drive home. I live about 10 minutes away from the park. Suddenly, I got a phone call from an unknown number. I answered it. Somebody told me in a raspy voice I should not have left them there all alone, that I would regret it. I told them to never call me again and hung up. When I got to work, they told me they had found a dead dog at the place I'd reported the flashing lights. This was the work of an insane individual who was messing with me. Somebody who would do something so horrid. So, I used to be a ranger, in Colorado specifically, about seven years ago. I loved the job. I loved being outside and enjoying nature. Respect for animals and plants are always very important to me. So I made sure the guests would follow the rules. Patrolling the trails and park maintenance was my job. I was very fit at the time something that is very necessary for a job like this. It's not easy, and can be very physically demanding. I do recommend the job to nature lovers and social butterflies. The story I'm about to share with you isn't the reason I quit to get an office job. I was forced to quit. A direct blow to my right knee in a car accident caused a very bad fracture that I never fully recovered from. Now, 
I can't stand up for longer periods of time. So, as a job, it became impossible. Now for my story. Two years before the car accident, I was working pretty late. This was during the winter, so it got dark pretty early. I was by myself and there was nobody around. I was cleaning up the trash left by the visitors and was moving debris and tree branches on the side of the trails. This had happened a few times. I really took my time making the trails as safe as possible. That night, a lot of trash was seemingly left behind. It took me longer than I anticipated, and I lost track of time. I don't really mind working late. I was single and childless at the time. I just had my dogs waiting for me back at home. As I said before, there was nobody around and it was as quiet as it can get in the park. At some point, I had heard a really loud sound, like something heavy was thrown onto the ground. I assumed it was a tree branch. I looked up to where I heard the noise and walked towards it, expecting to see some wood or something. When I came closer, I noticed there wasn't anything on the ground, but right after making that observation, I heard the same loud thud a bit further away from me. When I directed my eyes towards where I heard the second noise, I was surprised to see the silhouette of a person standing behind a tree. This person was very small, so small that it could have been a child. I had never encountered a person by themselves that late at night. Nobody was supposed to be there. I just stood there watching for a while, until I decided to ask the person what they were doing there. As soon as the first words left my mouth, this person began running. They weren't really fast and, surprisingly, didn't trip over anything. I began chasing the person immediately, not giving them a lecture, but to make sure they didn't get lost in the woods. That would be incredibly dangerous and could result in injury or even death in extreme cases. At some point, after a lot of running and calling out for them, they disappeared out of sight. I was surprised at how fast this person was. I considered myself to be very fit and I even used to go running frequently in high school. It seemed impossible to me, but that wasn't what I was worried about at the moment. I called my supervisor to report the incident. He told me to wait for him and that one of my colleagues would do a search together with me. As soon as I ended the call, I heard the same thud behind me. This was the opposite direction of where we were running towards. I was certain that this person could not have walked past me without noticing. I was very confused. I turned around, saw the same silhouette behind another tree. I was pretty sure it was the same person, as they were the same height and posture. Once again, calling out for this, but there was no reaction. However, when I took a step towards them, they began running in a completely different direction. After I lost them once, I realized I didn't really know where I was, so I decided to find my way back. As I tried to find my way, I felt like I was walking in circles. It was confusing, as I usually navigated around the park without any issues. I was lost. When I tried to call my supervisor to help find my way back, I had lost service somehow. I had tried multiple times, but it did not work. I began getting scared. I called out for the stranger and once again, there was no reaction. I walked around for hours, but did not get anywhere. I decided to get some rest and wait for the sun to rise. I fell asleep, sitting against a tree and was woken up by a woman and her child. The walk-in trail was only a few meters from where I had slept. I was certain at the time that I wasn't close to any trail. It was so weird and unsettling. I don't know how to explain how I felt. For a couple of months after this happened, I had very bad nightmares about the same situation. My supervisor and colleague had been looking for both me and the stranger that night after my call, but did not find either one of us. They were also a bit confused about the situation, but told me that it must have been a teenager trying to play tricks, and that I was just too tired to navigate myself. I know that's not true but don't know how to logically explain what happened that night. Maybe all of you can help me. I'm a ranger in Yosemite National Park. I believe that I've seen what people refer to as a real-life alien spaceship. I even touched it with my bare hands. 
It was a few years back, when I was still quite new to the job. It May 7th in 2003, to be exact. I was patrolling an area because of a report stating that a strange sound was being heard there every night past midnight. Light shows like a full laser light were in display. Some speculated that teenagers were having a party in the woods past midnight as the reason behind these noises, but come on, none of that even made sense. A couple of rangers were already investigating the case after not finding much. I was also added to the case. I was only 23 at the time and full of enthusiasm to solve it. I investigated everything from testimonies to the witnesses themselves, surveying the whole area. I tracked possible suspects and I even began camping on those said sites. There were a couple of places, but initially it's all in one big area. There were six places on the list and I camped every night on the spot. I grew more and more aware of what the woods look like at night, especially the creatures that come out when the sun sets. I've witnessed a human disappear into thin air. I've witnessed glowing insects flickering in different light. Things I've documented. It was 2003, so the phone camera was not really viable. Unfortunately, I had no clear evidence of these things. It was the last place on the list. It was around 5. I was setting up camp when suddenly, all my gadgets started producing these strange static noises. I thought of going back since my equipment might be faulty, but it was strange since, at that time, everything was fine just the day before. Then, every single one would malfunction. After a couple of minutes, it stopped and everything was back to normal. I did not have high hopes of finding them. The problem at some point is that I realized this might not be what seems after everything I've witnessed so far, but it was definitely not going to be normal. Now, I've told all my discoveries to my fellow rangers. Some believed and others laughed. To those who believed, they said they saw the same thing, but when they went back to look for it, it was gone. It was never in the same place. It's like it would only want to show itself in the right time and right place and then vanish forever. At first, I had some hope, but they were right. I came to the exact same spot. I moved around the area, but nothing. It was really gone. As I was having my dinner that night at the last spot, the moon was full and beautiful. As I was chowing down on my food, my eyes caught a flash of light. It was only for a moment, but I saw it and saw where it had come from. Like a beacon of light, it showed me the way. I went towards to what I believe was the spot and then my walkie-talkie began going haywire, producing this strange static noise. I turned it off immediately in fear it would alert whatever this thing was responsible. I searched and searched and searched. Finally, it was around 10 p.m., but nothing. I felt like giving up and suddenly... A strong breeze blew from my left side. I turned and there, I saw it. Like a huge egg with rings like Saturn slowly lifting up. It was hovering and producing this weird sound, like a deep engine noise. I hid behind a tree, heart pounding like crazy. This was it. At the time, I felt like this was it. This was the unrevealed side of this world, and I'm witnessing it. I crouched down. I kept observing it, like an egg surrounded by rotary rings. It was pitch black, and then the metallic glow reflecting light from the moon. I might not have any clues as to what I'm seeing, but I know for certain it was nothing made from Earth. I was captivated, and then suddenly its outer shell cracked. Even the rings on those cracked were lights. Neon blue were close to that color. Out of nowhere, four metallic pipes extended from this thing. It acted as a stand and supporting this large ship. I crouched in that spot, not daring to move for what felt like an hour. There was nothing else that changed after the stand came out of it. It's like it froze in place still, and I didn't dare to move. I kept looking at it with haggard breath. I felt a couple more hours pass when something happened. The cracks on the surface closed up, 
and it went back to how it used to be. Then, nothing more happened for a while. It slowly stood up, and I tried my best to sneak up to it. A turtle's pace. I made sure to avoid making as much noise as possible. Just a couple of more meters, and I would be up close and personal to it. I was now on all fours, crawling like a dog, just to get close to it. I lifted my hand and managed to touch it. It was like how I imagined it, smooth with a metallic texture. I was about to caress it. When a high-pitched noise sounded, it felt like my eardrums would break. I clutched my ears with my hands, and the next thing I know, I wake up in a hospital bed. I was found unconscious by a ranger, taken to the hospital after not being responsive. They walked among us, I know it, I've seen it. I'm still searching for evidence. I believe that the high-pitched sound was a warning that a human had found them. The ship probably left in a hurry. They have become more aware. Hopefully, a lot less active too. When I was younger, I worked as a ranger in Georgia Park. Most of my nights were spent instructing people not to leave out offerings for bears and other animals. But every now and again, I got a call about rowdy teens or even rowdier adults. It was thankless work, but dealing with the public often was. One night, I was leaning back in my chair, listening to a podcast in a last-ditch effort to stay awake. The phone rang. Normally, I relished the action. The night shift was miserable without it. But it was 30 degrees out tonight. I had no registered campers. The last thing I wanted to do was leave the central heating of my post to go and hunt down a group of kids that ran off to make out in the woods. Frustrated long before I had the chance to say hello, I brought the phone to my ear, waiting for somebody to say something. However, no matter how I called to the other person, there was only heavy breathing in response. Nothing like a good old-fashioned prank call to make the hate of youth just a bit more than I already did. I hung up, resuming my podcast, content to doze off until morning. The prank caller had other plans. They called four times, only ever breathing heavier into the receiver. By the fifth call, my patience was now at its end. I answered with a sharp, What? Only to have it steamrolled by crying and begging. A muddled voice and very indecipherable. I don't remember how long I spent trying to calm her down before she finally choked something out. By the river, please help. The line went dead, because why wouldn't it have? And then nobody else called. All efforts to call her back were met with telltale ring of a busy phone line. But by the river was too vague. The river stretched through most of the part. It would take hours to comb the area on my own. But when I realized it was my line that was cut, I had no other choice. I grabbed my shotgun off the wall, hoping almost desperately that it was a bear taking a break from hibernation to hassle a woman for her peanut butter sandwich and not another psychopath. Hello, is anybody out there? I stood on the doorstep with my ear to the wind, hoping to get some kind of clue for what direction to head off into. I was met with silence. I heaved a sigh of defeat and chose a direction at random. When I found her, I swore I'd give her a good old piece of my mind. Not only was it freezing, but the trails were pretty clear about getting near the river. There were endless, deadly combinations lurking within their depths, and some said the dagger did not solely lie beneath the water. Some said that the gray woman walked along the banks, crying out for help in an effort to lead compassionate bystanders into the water. A story I didn't necessarily believe. It was entertaining, nevertheless. The stories my coworkers came up with never ceased to tickle me. I was about 30 minutes away from the ranger's station when I stepped on something squelching beneath my boots. It was hard to make out in the darkness, but as I knelt down before the mass, I realized exactly what I was dealing with. Someone's wet clothes sat in a heap, discarded in a hurry to an effort to warm up after falling in. The ice was rarely thick enough to bounce an acorn off it, 
let alone pretend to be capable of holding a human's weight. So, I can only wonder how anybody could have gotten so soaked. Even if they'd slid down the bank, there was no way they'd been submerged the way these garments suggested that they had been. I'd been about to start searching for blood trails when a voice came from the other trees. It was nothing more than a hiss, but it sent my heart into overdrive either way. My first instinct was to haul it back where I came from, to leave the whispers behind once and for all. But the shotgun in my hand was more than capable of turning a human into Swiss cheese. So, I pushed forward. I called into the trees, demanding that the person hiding amongst the leafless branches come out with their hands up. When nothing happened, I called again, this time warning them that I'd shoot if they did not say something. Stop screaming, she'll hear. The voice from the trees didn't seem to understand the concept of packing heat. I could only wonder if she was in throes of a psychotic break. And there was nothing else out there, after all. Yet, she was huddled amongst the vegetation, whimpering about some mysterious she. I was moments from threatening her with the cops, and I heard the same voice from over the phone. It was just as hysterical as it had been, just as watery and hard to understand as it had been over the phone. If not for the icy hand on my wrist, I'd have followed the voice of the person I'd originally gone searching for. It was my job to help those in need on the trail, and I had no reason to hesitate. But the woman's hold was unbreakable in that moment, and her hissed warning to stay still made me think twice. I tried to help her, the woman told me. Her face was a breath away from my own, but she was as cold as the rocks along the river's edge. The heat that radiated from the living beings was completely missing in her, but my attention went elsewhere as the voice called for help again. And if you don't want to end up like me, you'll go back the way you came. I have no idea what to account for. I can only assume this was the poltergeist of a woman who had passed. As a park ranger, you become immune to many weird things. Strange figures in the woods, unnatural-looking animals, or even the downright paranormal. After a point, you kind of just live with it. The rule is, if you don't interfere in matters that concern you, you'll be safer for the most part. I hope the rule works, because sometimes situations get far too real and scary. They get far, far too real. Granted, not every ranger experiences the paranormal. While most of us lead somewhat adventurous lives, some more than others, there's also a category of rangers who wouldn't consider their job anything but mundane. To this day, I belonged in the middle of this spectrum. But something happened last week. While I would have liked to ignore it, as I usually do, I don't think I can. My partner, whom we'll call Carlos, had patrol duty for the night. We have both been relocated, and recently, into this cabin, somewhere in the corner of the park, where several other rangers have stayed in the past. It's a decent little space. Two adjoining rooms and a tiny little bath. Not very spacious, but who am I to demand luxury in the middle of nowhere, and at a job like this? Anyway, around 7 p.m., we had some tea, read some news, and put on our gear, leaving the cabin. There aren't many other rangers stationed nearby at the moment, so we had a lot of ground to cover. I didn't mind. I liked walking in the dark. Sure, it had been scary for my initial years as a ranger, but over time, I found it to be very peaceful. This is weird, I know, but the peace for me is very real. I had once asked Carlos if he liked patrol duty better in the dark, and he told me he didn't really care for it. I guessed most people wouldn't. On the way, I looked around the cabin, observing my surroundings. Thick tall trees, a moist brown soil, and a cool breeze. The holy trinity of good vibes. I would have liked to hear some music, but it makes me drowsy for some reason. So, I merely settled for random noises you usually hear. The wind was oscillating between a sudden gust and gentle breezes. As a result, the rumbling and crackling of leaves and bushes were almost rhythmic in nature. 
we walked for an hour straight, in silence, before finally getting bored and making some small talk. Carlos started by cracking some pathetically lame jokes. Then, that somehow transitioned into horror stories. He belonged to an orthodox home and strongly believed in the paranormal. And for a guy from New Jersey, he definitely has some good scares up his sleeve. We had been working together now for a few weeks, but have been paired together only a few times. I enjoy his stories. They're much better than his jokes. Around what I guess was two or three in the morning, we sat down on a tree that had fallen nearby. I took out some juice I had brought with me, handed him one. They had felt unnaturally cold for the weather then, and the actual condensation on the outside. I don't even think I had brought them that cold. In hindsight, that should have been a major flag. We drank. I was getting creeped out at this point, but I obviously could not show it as we shared more stories. He was telling me this story about some flying vinegar dipped vampire from the Philippines, and that's when I heard a groan. My instinct told me it was an injured creature, but I didn't feel like the groan of an animal. It felt humanly, like that of an older woman grunting in pain. It was very distinct. Carlos and I had jumped up from the log at the same time. He had heard it too. I nodded at him, and he pointed the light and his flashlight in the direction of the sound. It came again, albeit a little more distant this time. I called out, but there was no response. With my right hand on my firearm and my flashlight in the left, I followed the direction of the voice, calling out repeatedly. The groan came yet again, we increased our pace. I was in front, while Carlos quickly trailed behind, calling out a series of hellos and is anybody there, like a broken record. After a minute or so of walking, we discovered the source of the voice. In front of us was a short, pale old woman in a black cape, facing towards us but looking straight down and mumbling something. She was bald and her cape was very baggy and tattered. I instantly sensed something unnatural. It creeped the heck out of me. However, in the off chance that this was a human, we were obligated to help her. Carlos approached the woman, asking if she was hurt, and when she looked up, her face was wrong. In the dim light, I could see the manifestation of the unnaturalness I had felt a second ago. Her eyes were pitch black, as if nothing there, and she looked at Carlos with those alien eyes. Even her skin was dead-looking, a dark blue. He froze in his tracks. Her mouth was basically a huge gash in her face that went ear to ear. This lady, or whatever this thing was, put on her hood and shifted her gaze toward me, speaking something telepathically before just vanishing in the middle of nowhere almost like she had just disintegrated. I staggered, fell backwards, not sure what to even think. Her movements were even unnatural and human, just like her appearance. I don't know how to describe it, but was this an alien or a demon? I looked over at Carlos. His face was more white than it had ever been, and he knelt down in audible prayer. It was only after a while that I found the strength to get up. My legs still shaking violently, but they still worked. They felt extremely cold and empty, but somehow I found the strength that helped Carlos up. We made our way straight back to the cabin, following the markers on the trees. I poured some hot tea while he sat at the table with his head in his hands. Now, it was about 5 a.m. God knows how much time we had spent sitting there on the ground, too weak to get up, I tried discussing what we had saw, but he would not respond, so I left it alone. Around 9 a.m., I called my superior, told them of what had happened. He told me to get back to the job, asked me if we had been drinking while at work. They weren't much help, so I hung up on him. We had somehow again almost broken the rule and interfered, and as we did not do it again, we would be safe. The incident was very traumatizing. No sane person would believe me when I say we went back to the forest every night after, and still do. 
The rule is supposed to protect us, and we had faith on it. At least, I hope it does. This job has meant everything to me. I don't have a plan B, so I'm hoping I don't encounter this stuff anymore. I tried to look around and see if there's anything I could use as a reference before posting this, so when you read it, you would understand. It kind of reminded me of the witch I think they call the Lalarana, if I'm remembering correctly. But whatever this was, it was either a demon or a supernatural entity. It felt evil. It looked evil. Why it was there, I don't know. I don't care. I just don't want to see it again. I'm a ranger currently, and before this, I had another job at a different park that will probably never step foot in after what I experienced there last year. For the record, it's very busy. During the day, I got a lot of visitors and did a lot of walkthroughs and tours. My favorite part about the job was everybody left at night. I would have the park all to myself. I was the only one working that shift. I love nature. I'm the happiest when I'm outside, so this was the perfect job for me. One day, I had had this older lady come in and ask a tour. She was by far the nicest I had met, and she seemed to enjoy my company for some reason. She stalled the tour as much as she could, called me a child the entire time when saying something or making a statement or a question. That seemed sweet to me. She was just so sincere, and to share my same passion was wonderful. She told me later, I realized we pretty much felt the same way about nature, and even had a very similar connection. I felt something warm about this lady that I could not really describe it, but I didn't mind spending the entire day showing her around. As it got darker, she was beginning to get sad and I asked her about it. She told me that she was sad about her time with me passing and I told her she can come here any time if she wanted to and talk. She thanked me, said that she hopes that she will have a chance to come again. In her voice and eyes, I saw that somehow... She believed she would never see me again after that night. It was overall sad, and I wondered if she had a disease or something and was dying, but I thought it rude to ask, so I didn't. She said she wanted to show me something, and took me to the last part of the park. There was this beautiful fountain. She told me how the fountain was made of marble, and it was probably the most beautiful fountain that will ever be built, because it was built by her grandfather, and she loved very much. When she was a little girl, she would often come to the edge and look at the water, imagining what her life would end up like, but she never hoped it would turn out like it did. She was very calm and seemed like she was at peace with everything around her and inside of her. I couldn't believe somebody could be that peaceful. Although I told her I would be happy if she came around here more often, the sadness in her eyes remained. She took my face in her hands, told me she was proud of me, that it turned out just the way she could have hoped. That kind of confused me, but I didn't want to ask. She said it was time to say goodbye. I went behind the fountain. I followed her to see where she was going, but nobody was there. Now I was weirded out, as I didn't know where this old lady had disappeared to. And I asked the guy at the reception if an older lady with her description had left, and he said no. No older woman had came in today at all. The whole thing was extremely weird, but I ignored it and went on with my day. Now, fast forward two months later, I was looking through my mom's photo album and I saw a picture of the old lady. I was shocked and asked my mother who that was. What she told me made me question my reality and my memory to this day. She said that she was my great-grandmother. I still don't believe that something that unexplainable happened to me. The next day, I quit my job. If I ever saw that fountain again, I would ask about it. And I'm too afraid to find out what that woman told me is true. My father was a park ranger, and he always loved the woods, as nature provided him and his family with countless memories. And my grandfather was also an explorer, so he always used to wander many places with his curious mind. Eventually, my father acquired the trait and became a ranger. It was one of those holidays when tourists come in search of adventure, but end up getting in trouble. People come to the national parks for fun, 
experienced some for field research. However, there was this team whom my father had assisted. They had come in search of a secret to way unknown. Now, I know I may sound like a total dumbstruck human, but they were a team of five researchers who were sane and educated, maybe more than the rest. One night, my father's acquaintance got signal on walkie-talkie. It was a signal from one of his fellow researchers. After grabbing his rifle, he went ahead and investigated. When his jeep would not allow him to go any further, they had to walk the rest of the path. The tracker with the group stopped working after one time, so now they had to search in two different directions. Therefore, they decided to tie ribbons that way. They were going so nobody could get lost. When his jeep would not allow him to go any further, they had to walk the rest of the path. Now, the tracker with the group had stopped working after one time, so they were now forced to search in two different directions. Therefore, they decided to tie ribbons the way they were going, so nobody would get lost. Yellow was his color, and blue was one of his partners. As my father went ahead, he tied ribbons as a mark of the way. He kept venturing deeper into the woods, but could not find the group. Therefore, he tried to contact his partner through walkie-talkie, but never did get an answer back. Now, he is still walking and tying ribbons when, one time, he encountered a yellow ribbon tied to a tree. Maybe he took a different route before. Then again, he did go into a different direction, looking out for them. After 15 to 20 minutes, he encountered the ribbon yet again. This kept happening, so this time, he stopped to take a rest. While he was sitting under the tree, he looked up casually, and the ribbon caught his eye. It looked different for some reason. So he got up to look at it, and to his surprise, this was not the ribbon he tied earlier. These ribbons looked old and worn out. Besides, the knot on the ribbon was double-knotted, and he tied them in only one knot. This area is restricted, where only important personnel were allowed. So, who would come all the way out here and tie these yellow ribbons halfway to a tree? He knew something was amiss. And my father came up with the idea of following these unknown marks and finding his way to the correct ones. When he was walking his way back, he heard some signing and there was light coming from that direction. When he was walking in the direction of the light, he discovered a group of researchers who were wearing weird clothing and dancing in circles with fire in the middle. There were only four of them. One person was missing. He had hid behind a big tree and tried to figure out what they were trying to do. Two of them went into the woods, brought a big wooden branch and a man tied to it, his two hands and legs bound together. He was definitely dead. They had tried to cook him alive. My father was scared to see this, so he reached out to contact his partner, but there was no response. After having that choice, he left. But when he got up, he heard the sound that something was still around, and now his life was in danger. He too ran away, and these cannibalistic murders were still behind him. He climbed up a tree to try and divert their attention, and they were there, waiting for him just below the tree. When he carefully looked at their feet, he could see that these things, they weren't exactly people, but like people. They were wicked looking. While they looked human, they were different in appearance. He knew immediately something was very wrong. These things scoured around the forest, looking for him. They did not realize that he had climbed himself up in a tree and was waiting for these things to leave. They were these hideous looking creatures that were like men, but emaciated, slender and white, having huge fangs and large hollowed out eyes. And once they had finally disappeared, he slowly made his way down the tree, looking for every direction, making sure these things were not coming back. That's when my father began to fall unconscious. He was poisoned. Something had seeped into his skin, and he fell right there, collapsing on the forest floor. Next thing, he's waking up in the hospital when he described the incident to senior officials. They denied his statement. Any clearance he had should have been revoked. It was very shortly after this 
that he was no longer a park ranger. He was stripped of virtually everything he had at that career. It was also after this that my father had received multiple death threats. And there were some things he's seen that day and information he knows that is very sensitive and that is not allowed to escape into the public. I worked as a ranger in Northern Carolina for well over 20 years. I've had my fair share of weird happenings and some gruesome ones too. I found multiple dead bodies during my time working there. All of the killers were luckily brought to justice by the police. But it's not the killings that got me to quit my job and never come back. It was something a little more unexplainable. Something so weird, in fact, that I sometimes still wonder if it was all just a dream or vision or indeed a real event. I'll tell you exactly what I saw from the beginning. It was the middle of August and the sun was scorching the ground with its rays. Not many people visited during the day for obvious reasons. I hated when I had to leave my guard hut to make a tour of the park. That would usually include a lot of sweating and feeling like somebody is roasting you in a pan. I was already pretty beat during my first two hours, drinking more than enough water to try and keep hydrated. As it was already time to go out for the third and final tour of the day, because for the next shift, another ranger was going to replace me. I went on a walk. About halfway through, I started feeling dizzy and a little lost. I felt weaker and weaker up until I could not stand anymore. I sat under a nearby tree to try and get some rest and regain strength. But the sun and heat were too strong. I began seeing things and just felt a little too real. The tall, shadowy figures began emerging from behind trees walking slowly and aimlessly. I couldn't move or breathe properly, so I just sat there, staring back at them. In a minute, there were so many of them, I lost count, and more began emerging straight from the ground. I was confident that I had had a severe sunstroke. They didn't seem to pay any attention to me at first. They just wandered around and let out horrific screams of pain, like somebody being cooked alive. Just then, one of those figures had noticed me, slowly making its way. It was over eight feet tall, so it had to crouch down to get close to me. I was petrified, but I didn't possess the strength to do anything. The figure didn't stop screaming for a split second either. It just crouched next to me and put its hand on my cheek. I started to burn. I lost consciousness. Other rangers found me passed out on the ground about an hour later getting me to an ambulance. I was relieved for a minute, but when I had got up from the bed, I saw that red burning handprint. It terrified me so much, I had to resign. None of my bosses or colleagues ever believed me. I guess I can't say I blame them. Back when I was a kid, my mother always spoke about her mom being a ranger. She would tell my mom, how much she loved it. It inspired me to want to follow in her footsteps. With my grandparents dying and all, I watched my mother do her job and she loved that park with everything she had. She did it well. She claims the only downfall was all the odd stuff she had heard in the trees and that was apparently normal. As I grew up, I took over. Every day that I am on the job watching, I make sure that I always have my special soda with me. It always brings me comfort knowing I have my favorite drink. My friends always told me not to apply for the job, since so many resign and so many are told to keep quiet about things they see. My friends told me that people who get an opportunity to become a ranger, you begin to see some strange things. Back in 2019, I got a call to do the night shift for a park. My husband told me not to go. We had already made plans to go out for Christmas. I said we can't go out to eat if I'm not working to put food on the table. Besides, they need extra rangers to patrol, and I need to be there to help. We can celebrate when I get back. I went out the door, heading to the park. I was thinking on the way to the job that if I get bit by something, nobody is there to save me. At least I have my watch that the job gave me to communicate with others. The job is a blessing. Even if you are in trouble... You can always call somebody and they will help. 
Usually, as I arrived to work, I see my best friend at work and did not know she was on the same shift. She had been doing a double. When I approached her, we spoke and she told me about the strange noises she heard right near a pond. All I wanted to do was go home and be with my husband. I really couldn't do anything but continue the job. She clocks back in for break and I'm just beginning my shift. It dawned on me that I forgot where my watch was. My friend told me to stay posted. I agreed. We walked to my vehicle to get my soda. Anyway, I look over and I can't find my drink. I kept telling her the stage just gets better and better. The event has started and we are now patrolling the park, making sure everything is running smoothly. She gets a call, telling her she needs to split and go to the other side. Someone is requesting her. She told her boss, Copy, that she would report back to him. Turns out the boss never told her to split. It was something interfering. I went to the other side of the park to check on her, and I watched this creature jump down from the tree onto her back, driving both of them into the pond. I ran, trying to rip her off, but this thing was so strong, it was not worth it. This creature went into the water so fast, I didn't see it. It was a blessing that I managed to survive. But my friend, well, that's a different story. I immediately reached out to the dispatcher in the park. Nobody answered. I called again from the watch and got the boss. I told them I was worried and what had happened. He said they were going to send help right away. They went in after her to try and locate her body, but there was no such luck finding anything. We had to shut down the park. We could not risk any of the public getting injured. We also informed the authorities and had them evacuate out of the park. Police said that it was something out of the ordinary that dragged her into the pond, as if that wasn't any more obvious. When we began to review the footage, we saw and heard the noise that she had mentioned. My boss had simply come to the conclusion that she was going crazy, and we know she had been going through things, but this is definitely not crazy. We had to call our family and let them know what had happened. So my job asked me, called me, while we were being so close. They did not take it well. So before I went home, I stopped by and let them know what happened. They were in disbelief. They could not believe it. I went home after, and before I could share with my husband what had happened, he saw the scratches on my arm and face from that thing. I broke down and told him that she's dead and everything had to be closed down. Facing her family was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. This is the only Christmas where I've had to work and I hate it. I hate what I had to see. I come from Phoenix, Arizona. I haven't traveled to many places during my life, but I was born, raised, and schooled there. Since I didn't want a boring city job, but I didn't feel like moving either. I signed up to be a ranger in the Tonto National Forest. The job wasn't easy or fun all the time, but at least I didn't have to sit in a crowded office all day. I loved my job for the most time. I really did. All up until a crazy night that I won't forget. I was working my third shift, starting late in the evening, while doing the first tour. It was still fairly light outside. There wasn't a whole lot to see. Many people have already gone home and the rest were well on their way. I finished the tour, headed back to my station. Time flew by quickly and I was already getting prepared to do the second and longest tour of my shift. I had to walk about four miles down a rocky road, all the way to the Theodore Roosevelt Lake. The walk down was quite easy and very quiet. I reached the lake in less than one hour. I was a bit tired from walking, so I sat by the lake to try and get some rest. The first thing I hear was a splash. It sounded like a very large fish jumping out, falling back into the water. Shortly after that, there was another, but this one was closer and louder. It sounded far too big for a fish. I got startled a little bit, so I stood up and began slowly backing away from the lake. The thing in the water began to speed up as well, and I could see something was waving its tail towards the shore. Still walking backward, I was focused to see what will emerge from the water, and the first thing I saw was a mouth. 
a huge mouth and long one, with many teeth slowly creeping off from the lake. I moved faster back, up the hill, turning my head to see what was behind me after a few steps. When I turned my head, I realized the creature was already running towards me at full speed, looking somehow crocodilian. Its legs were short, but having huge claws on its feet. It resembled the famous Bear Lake monster. I was terrified. Even though it was short, it was moving and closing the distance between us. My instincts kicked in. I managed to pull myself up, quite high on one of the pine trees. I stayed up there for a whole seven hours while this thing waited for me to come down. Only when the sun had come up had it disappeared. I finally got off the tree and sprinted the full four miles to the station. They sent over divers and some police, but didn't take what I had reported too seriously. I still work there, but I refuse to go near that side of the forest. And trust me, I get crap for it all the time for my buddies. My name's Dean. I used to be a ranger of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, located in Northern Carolina. I was guiding a group of Spanish tourists. None of them knew English. Our communication was more than terrible. I left them near a river, returning to base. Two hours go by. I returned to see if everybody was fine and if nobody was lost. We went back to a safe place. The afternoon was turning into night, and being there would be extremely dangerous. We arrived, and one of the tourists told me that we had forgot somebody. A young woman with a notebook. He told me she was trying to collect some data about birds and insects. Immediately, I went to search for her. I took everything I had. Before going... I told everybody to stay there, and I'd be back in a half hour flat. The forest was dark, the insects' noises. I heard her distress call near the river. I arrived there, and she was being attacked by bats. I grabbed my gun, firing several shots into the air. The bats fled, and the woman had some superficial bite wounds. She panicked and fainted. I waited for her to recover. Then, take her back to the safe place where I can get her first aid. We were walking. She was having some difficulties, even if I was helping her. The forest was dark and suddenly began to rain as we walked harder. Some hours had passed, and we had arrived. The other tourists were waiting for a return and became shocked at what had happened. I gave her first aid. All the tourists asked to get back to the city. I told them that would not be possible in that condition. It was raining a lot. The track was wet and probably would all suffer accidents. I told everybody to sleep, and when the morning appeared, the young woman was dead. Her body had more wounds than last night. An old man had some bite wounds in his left arm and did not wake up. His wife had tried to wake him, but when finally he woke, he had a severe heart attack and died. The old woman in tears. The other two tourists tried to calm her down and ask me what happened. After hours of searching, night came and this time, I was completely alone. Five years of working as a ranger of this park it gave me the knowledge to be prepared for anything. Or so I thought. At midnight, I heard a strange noise. Sounding like a huge airplane or something. I decided to go see what was happening. I arrived and saw something that nobody would believe in my words. Giant bats. And I'm not talking about regular bats. These were massive. The size of humans. And what's worse, as I saw them in the light, they were human hybrids. Part human, part bat. And they were devouring the body of a wolf. With hands and claws. And a face that looked like a demon. I panicked, running faster than I could. These things saw me, flying off in the sky and taking my direction, almost trying to catch me. The woods were dark and my light only prevailed through so much darkness. I entered a small cavern that would provide me ample coverage. I guess you can call it a cavern. It was more like a little outing in the wall. But they were flying in the air looking for me. They looked like large, deformed black dogs, taller than humans, 
red eyes and long tails. I shot at one of them, and they came screaming in my direction. I waited for the right moment to run, returning back. When I had arrived, I could still hear them flying around in the distance. I told everybody to keep quiet, immediately radioing my boss, telling him we have an issue. He asked that I speak with him in private, as it sounded like he kind of already knew what was going on. When I spoke to him, he threw some paperwork in front of me and told me to sign it. It was an NDA. He looked at me and told me, this is not going to be the first time you have to sign these. Better get used to it on this job. Which is why I have to be very careful with my identity. At the beginning of this story, I told you my name was Dean. Obviously, I'm sure you've already guessed, that's not my real name. It's merely a placeholder. I guess there are several other rangers who have seen these same bats. What they are, I'm not sure. Could they be the elusive bat squatch? Possibly, but they looked far more hideous. And unlike a bat squatch, they were not covered in hair. They were far worse. Unfortunately, not all is as it seems in these national parks, and many of these things were told to keep quiet about. All I can say is for anyone who wanting to venture out at night, be very, very careful, whether you're in a national park or not. I had just enlisted in the Forest Service in 2006 and was working in the Algonquin Park for the summertime. I never understood why they paid me as little as they did for all the things I had to deal with. To give you some more context, the Algonquin Park is this massive wildlife preserve uh, full of moose, black bears, elk, etc. And this is why it makes it such an excellent tourist trap. We're always finding weird things too, like tracks and scat, which is pretty normal, but not when you find human-looking scat and four times the size. That's when things begin to get very unnerving. In fact, I had several people on a trail, a very popular trail, which name and route I won't mention, but they had reported seeing very large piles of human scat along the side. After being disgusted, thinking somebody could not wait to find the bathroom, or was just simply going in the great outdoors far too close to a road that people travel. After inspection, this was far larger than any human could produce. Also, around the scat pile were these massive footprints that were evidently from a bipedal being. Nearby these prints are large blackberry bushes, meaning that whatever was around here was probably eating berries and doing its business. I never thought Bigfoot was a possibility, but the more and more I see this kind of stuff, the more evidence I'm exposed to, the more I'm becoming a believer, I should say. A few days ago, I met with one of my friends from school at a local cafe. This is when I was doing my shift. He had ordered a latte when I had recognized him. He had also recognized me when he looked right at me. We chatted pleasantries while I made coffee to know that he was now a park ranger. I was interested. Asked him to tell me more about his job after my shift. After my shift had ended, I walked over to his table while he was reading a book. He began telling me about how he first loved his job but recently had been having some strange supernatural occurrences that creeped him out. He was even considering resigning. I asked him what he saw, and he told me about some things that he had seen that were very concerning. One day, near dusk, he was patrolling the park along with three other rangers. They walked and patrolled a stream that flows in the park so they don't get lost. When it was completely dark, they turned back towards the cabins of the park rangers. As they were walking, they saw a big creature just a few feet away from them. It was almost eight feet tall with thick hands and feet. It nearly matched the description of a Bigfoot, except it had the head of a lion. My friend and his co-workers got so scared, they began running towards the cabin, blindly shooting behind them. The creature was so thick and heavy that it could not run as fast as them, struggling to keep up. Soon, they started to see bright lights shining outside the cabin every night as it came closer. When they reached the cabin door and looked back, 
there was no creature in sight, especially not the Bigfoot-looking lion. They told the whole occurrence to the rest of the rangers. They did not believe them at first, but one of the rangers said he believed them, since he also saw something unnatural a few days back. Only he didn't dare share. He thought it was just his imagination. On asking him what he saw, he told them he saw a small creature, almost one feet tall, with thin, stick-like arms and legs. It's totally opposite to what my friend and the other rangers had saw that patrolled around with him saw. I was shocked to hear these types of creatures existed, and advised him to resign and get a job that's away from the supernatural. He said that no job is away from the supernatural, as they could always shapeshift, or choose to be invisible if they wish. So, even my job of serving coffee, I could have an encounter with anything unnatural. While working as a park ranger, I had an experience with the supernatural. It was a scary ordeal, I must confess. A group of hikers had gotten lost in the woods, and my fellow rangers and I had decided to scout out the area. We got the general direction from the report that was made by their own families. Heading off in the direction, we drove until we got to the entrance of the woods, where they had last made contact with their families according to the report. We parked the car just outside the woods and proceeded to search for them. We had searched for a better part of the day without anything to show for it. It was late in the evening already, and we had walked deep into the woods. I was feeling uneasy with every step we took. It was as if there was a terrifying monster hidden within the woods. A sense of terror suddenly engulfed me, making me break out in cold sweat. I glanced at my colleague, who seemed to have sensed nothing, as his expression was as usual. I could not put my finger on it, but something eerie was happening in the woods. Suddenly, we began seeing strange markings, words written in an unknown language, different depictions on trees. What was strange was the fact that my colleague, for some reason, was unaware of everything. It was like he was in another dimension. He was detached from his surroundings. It was in that moment that it hit me. A dimension. Had he mistakenly stepped into a dimensional portal? Was that how hikers had gotten lost? Had they stepped into it as well? If they had, that would explain the disappearance and why we were unable to find traces of them. It was, of course, a mind-blowing theory, so I wanted to test it out. I moved closer to my colleague, attempted to touch him. My hands went right through him like he did not exist. I could see him, but I couldn't touch him. I called out his name, hoping to get his attention and alert him to the danger we were in. I called out his name several more times, even radioed him. Yet, he continued walking deeper into the woods like a puppet on its string being pulled. After my futile attempts... I proceeded to search for the missing party on my own. I came across so many skeletons and bones piled up into a small mountain. At this point, the terror in my heart had reached its peak. I resisted the urge to scream. I beat a hasty retreat and stepped on numerous bones in the process. What scared me was that the bones did not let out the usual crunch sound after being stepped on. Rather, they simply crumbled into dust. I cannot help but wonder how long these bones had been buried there. This took my mind to the missing hikers. Were they already bones? Or were they alive, like me, terrified and hopeless? I was at my wit's end already, and I could not help but feel despair. I glanced at my wristwatch to check the time. But what I saw shocked me. Time moves faster here. I had barely spent two hours in the woods, yet... My wristwatch was displaying a date that was two days ahead. Two hours equal two days here. At this rate, my lifespan would run out before whatever was lurking around would kill me. At this point, all I had in my mind was how to escape this hellhole that I had somehow gotten myself into. All thoughts of searching and rescuing the lost hikers did not cross my mind at this point. All I could think of was how to get out of my situation 
my mind was now in chaos, disoriented, and I could not think straight. Just when I thought things could not get any worse, I began hearing voices and the feelings of being stalked overwhelmed me. I could feel something or someone watching me, and the thought of that made me panic. There was nothing scarier than the unknown, especially in a place such as this. I kept on walking, my nerves taut and on edge, ready to react to any situation. I moved on without a sense of direction, hoping to luckily find an exit or something. Glancing at my wristwatch, I saw, to my utter dismay, I had spent close to a week now trapped in this place. While I was aware that time was moving faster, things would be different as long as I found an exit. It did nothing to comfort me. I had no idea when I would find an exit out of this dimension. By the time I had spent a couple of months, I, through a stroke of luck, was able to find a way out. The moment I stepped out, my walkie-talkie buzzed incessantly. People had been trying to reach me, and even my colleague. I radioed my colleague, but got no reply. I knew he was still trapped in there, and there was no hope for him to get out. He was not even aware. My story caused a sensation, and I was rushed to the hospital for tests and examinations. The doctor confirmed that my cells had gone through rapid aging. My cells had grown older than they should have. I would had to have been placed on a special diet to prolong my lifespan. A few weeks later, the missing hikers were found. However, all of them had lost their youthful appearance, which further boosted the authenticity of my story. Despite getting intensive medical care, all hikers died mysteriously afterwards. My colleague disappeared, and I was told to keep quiet. The entire case was shut down before press could even get out, and no public knowledge ever became aware. So, you probably won't believe my story, but here it goes. I was working in a ranger station at a small California state park, looking after the forest. It was late September, meaning the amount of hikers there were dwindling, and it wasn't like the summer, where it's a great season for hiking. Yeah, the fall was great, because the weather is very nice and mild, and we saw quite a few people through the summer months, but fall is when it definitely dwindles. As I said, I was doing what I needed to do hiking around and patrolling the trails, doing regular ranger stuff, checking on things and making sure stuff was safe. I stopped to eat some lunch in an open field near one part of the park where there were no trees or big rocks, so a larger clearing. I sat down and was beginning to eat my favorite, a tuna sandwich. And I literally froze with a bite still in my mouth, stopping chewing, when I see these two dark pits which were eyes moving between tree to tree to my right. I just happened to look over in that direction and see something very large watching me. Then I hear branches and twigs snapping, confirming that what I was seeing was really there. Something very large and heavy, moving, trying to evade any sort of sighting by me. Then I could hear deep breaths, almost like a panting or a heavy wheezing noise. After wanting no part to play in whatever this thing was, I got up, put my sandwich in its bag and my pail, and walked back off the trail. However, it had an interest to me. It was following me, and was now moving briskly through the trees. I picked up my pace, and that's when everything around me fell quiet. Now I was beginning to feel very uncomfortable, like something had happened. I believe this thing followed me for a couple of miles before finally stopping, as the noises around me returned. And to this day, I have no way to account for what it was that I saw, and I don't want to think about it. Not my story, but a colleague's of mine. My colleague was responding to a call to check up on a camper, when he had pulled up. He noticed all the lights were out, which was strange considering the call was only made a few moments prior. When this ranger approached the tent, there was nothing, not a sound. 
it was as if everybody in the campsite had completely disappeared, leaving only him by himself. He was puzzled, not sure why somebody would make the call of this campsite and then be completely deserted. Then he described what he could hear as a weird growling noise, with kind of a chewing sound. He shines his light over in the direction of this noise and sees this tiny three-foot-tall furry humanoid thing standing there that reminded him of a chimpanzee. He was completely startled, nearly falling backwards on his behind. This thing also had a very surprised expression on its face, not really sure what to do. It quickly ran off, scurrying between the branches and the trees, going at about 30 miles an hour. My colleague claims that it looked partly human, a brow ridge and a nose very much like a human does, but the rest of the face was almost covered in hair and reminded him very much of an ape, besides the nose and the brow ridge. The eyes were also all black too, and it did not appear to be violent or aggressive in any way. And as it turns out, the campers at this campsite were being harassed by this tiny little humanoid ape thing, which is the reason why they left soon after they had made the call. Apparently, this thing was trying to get into one of their tents, in which they were scared and got in their car and deserted their camp. After speaking to a few friends of mine who are heavily into cryptozoology, they all believe that a juvenile Sasquatch was responsible. As soon as I turned 18, my parents demanded that I got a job. When three months passed, I was still unemployed. They went out and did it for me. I got hired at my family's ranger business. I supplied places with rangers and we'd go out and protect the park for however long the rangers' owners could pay. I started in early winter. I was cold all the time. The job I was working at did not start until about 9 at night, or at least my shift didn't. I had to work until 9 in the morning, 12 hours, 5 days a week. The pay was alright. It was my first day at a new park. It was a ski resort and they had hired rangers to act as security. We weren't really as qualified, but my family didn't have the greatest moral compass, so to speak. I started my shift, I talked with a little guy at the front, he said it was slow, not much happening. I was glad to hear this, sitting inside and doing nothing for 12 hours, that's what I'd normally be doing anyway. I went inside and met the guy I'd be working with, we'll call him Freddy. He was reading the paper and drinking coffee. First day, he'd asked. Well, I never worked at this place before, but I've been working with Tony for quite a while. It's a good business. I trust him. He responded with a little chuckle and went back to sipping his coffee. Nothing happened for a couple of hours. We sat back and relaxed. We talked about our lives and even got into a funny conversation about my uncle. About three hours in, we heard a loud banging at the door. Freddy got up to open it. There was nothing there, aside from a trail in the snow leading to the door. There wasn't much we could think about it. Maybe a bird or an animal. I don't know. Freddy said, getting back to his seat. I thought it was a bit weird for a bird to slam into the door fast enough to make a bang that loud and still somehow get back up and walk out of sight. I didn't say anything. I just shrugged. Whatever. After even more sitting and talking, Freddy got up and said that he was going to go use the bathroom. He jokingly asked if I could hold on the fort, then went outside to use the restroom. I leaned back in my chair, quietly singing a Billy Joel song that had been stuck in my head when Freddy basically kicked the door in, holding his hand. It was cut up and bleeding badly. I did not think to ask questions, so I shut up, ran to the first aid cabinet, grabbing the wrap and put it around his arm. What happened out there? I'd asked him. He looked in my eyes and opened his mouth. There was another super loud bang on the door. I rushed to the door and locked it. I didn't know what was out there, but I did not feel like waiting for it to realize the door was open. Freddy was screaming in pain. I wrapped his wounds, but it wouldn't keep up forever. I went over to the phone. I picked it up. It called an ambulance. I explained that something attacked my coworker. They asked what. I told them, I don't know. 
and they gave me a half-assed, we'll send somebody, and I hung up. They asked to stay on the line with them, but I didn't see how that would stop Freddy from bleeding out. Freddy slumped down, leaning against the table in the room. I slapped his face lightly to keep him awake. Freddy, who did this? He cleaned his eyes and couldn't be bothered to keep his head anymore. He was out. His cut was worse than I thought, and the ambulance needed to come very quickly. As I put a blanket on him, another loud bang at the window made me jump. I looked back, and there was a bloody hand on the window. It was a man, and he was begging to be let in. I ran over to the door and unlocked it. I went to the side where he was at, and I didn't see him. Did he run around? I looked down, and my jaw dropped. Right where he was standing was a trail of blood in the stand, going around the wall. I broke out of my shock, turning the corner, and there were the culprits. Just one wolf. But I know he wasn't the only one there. We both stood there, looking at each other. He snarled, and I gulped. I knew the time it took me to get the door was a lot less than it took him to get to me. I didn't want to risk it just in case. I kept standing there. He took a step back. Maybe he's leaving. I thought to calm myself down, but he did not leave. He took a step back and howled. And knowing what was coming, I ran to the door. He stopped. He lunged, biting into the flesh of my leg. I screamed out in pain, but... At least he wasn't calling his pack, or so I thought. He started to tear flesh, and I foolishly attempted to shake him off. He was on there tight, ripping. I tried to push him off, but his teeth only sunk in deeper. Now, I'd put my right hand between my leg and the roof of his mouth, prying his teeth. I limped inside, slamming the door shut. I could see him, these loud bone noises popping and seeing him now stand up on two legs, looking at me through the door. How I was lucky I had survived. I wasn't sure what to do. I was bleeding out pretty bad, and the only gun I had was in my jeep that was left outside. That's when I saw more of these things. They were upright walking wolves, and they were pacing around this place, moving back and forth, looking in the windows, waiting for one of us to come out. I sat there next to Freddy, holding him, holding myself, trying to keep myself conscious. I was bleeding pretty bad, and these things were out there. I counted at least three of them. Three of the largest wolves I'd ever seen in my life. What was going on? As I remember things starting to fade, I couldn't tell you what happened next, but the door burst open, and several EMTs rushed in, tending myself and Freddy. They loaded me up on a stretcher, threw me in the ambulance, and the next thing I know, I'm being patched up. After this, I never heard from Freddy again, and I was quickly removed from that location and reassigned to a different one altogether. I was told nothing. I was not allowed to ask questions. And even now, I live with a nightmare. A nightmare of strange wolves who were very violent, and had I not made it back inside, I would have been torn to pieces. My grandfather told me this story about the eerie incident that made him quit being a ranger. My grandfather used to work to be a park ranger in Uganda and had many stories to tell us about misbehaving teenagers who thought it was funny to stay illegally in the park overnight. White supremacist tourists who think they could hunt any time and even indigenous people who believe the land belonged to them. But this time, he told me the story why he resigned from being a ranger as he thought I was old enough to hear this creepy story, and after hearing it, I'm thankful for him quitting, or else I probably wouldn't be here today. One day, he and his co-worker, we'll call him Sam, went out to patrol at night. As they were walking, they saw a very high, unusual amount of snake activity, everywhere. Ignoring it, they continued on their job, and they had heard multiple trumpets of elephants, and saw many zebras running in no particular direction, just away from the place that he and his co-worker were going, deeper into the depths of the forest. They assumed that it was somebody, possibly teenagers, causing trouble. This made them cautious and alert for danger, 
they continued going deeper in with their rifles, loaded in lamps in front of them. Then, they saw a blue, shimmery light, glowing in the shape of a circle in the forest. It looked to be like a portal. My grandfather had advised his co-worker to examine it. As Sam leaned in to touch it, he was immediately sucked in like a vacuum. Now, I'm not relating Derek to trash, but who? Who touches a portal? After waiting a few moments for Derek to come out, but as expected, he didn't. My grandfather ran away from the portal and towards the cabin of rangers. There, he shared this unnatural incident with the rest of the rangers who slept there. They collectively decided to go check it out the next morning. The next morning, they went to the same place where my grandfather saw the portal. There was no portal, and no sign of Derek either. His co-workers then did not believe him, and said that Derek must have slipped drugs and hallucinated the whole thing. My grandfather resigned after that. He did not want to see more supernatural incidents happening, and also did not want to die. And there was a huge cover-up that happened, with Derek and him disappearing. Is he still alive in some alternate universe? Did he turn into something like a ghost? Is he dead? Nobody knows.